Good morning, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Welcome to the last study of this week in September. As we continue our conversation regarding this document, as we continue to look at the applications that are being made, shall we thank our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his blessing, and his direction, so that all things that we see, we may be able to determine are working together for his good will to be done in us. Shall we now praise him with a word of prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you, we thank you for all that you are doing in our lives and in these studies. Direct us now, Father. Show us that which you would have us to understand. I thank you for each person that has attended these studies. I ask, Father, for your blessing upon them. Show us now, Father, that which we should understand. Direct our steps, direct our conversation, direct our thoughts. We know that our great need of you. We thank you for this opportunity we have to praise you and be blessed by you. May your spirit open our minds. May your angels attend us so that we may more clearly understand that which you are trying to say to us now. Be with us, we ask. Direct us, we pray. And for this, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. As we are about to enter into page five of this document, the statement at the very beginning, the one power, the papal power, produced the other power, that of atheism. And both of them together engaged in a war against God in the Bible. And in the process, France was brought to ruin. These two powers working in tandem will always achieve the same result, the absolute ruin of a nation. Now, I'm having a hard time seeing the papal power producing atheism. <laughs> right. And... Even if we see that atheism, as Ellen White you know, says, that, that the groundwork is laid for basically that rebellion that comes from that atheism is, you wouldn't say that it produced it. And also to describe it as a power, atheism is not a power. Right? Right. Right. Now, France is a power and it's an atheistic power. But it's not atheism itself. I think this comes from a very direct misunderstanding mm -hmm. of the progression of the daily and the abomination which maketh desolate. Yeah, so so we have these these two desolating powers, the daily and the abomination, right? Paganism and papalism. Now atheism when it arises in France, is a new manifestation of satanic power. That is, atheism, um, especially the type that existed in France, I mean, that was very rare, right? I mean, you had, of course, governments that opposed the true God, such as Egypt, but you don't really have an atheistic world in, in that. It's I mean, it's not the new atheism of today, but it, it is the type of new atheism, right? right? It's it's where some just the denial of of all gods, though they replace it with another type of god, right? The god of god goddess of reason or nature, naturalism, and and it of course opens the door for uh, some of the ideas that happen later in the 1800s. Um, you know, with Darwin and so forth, evolution and all that. I mean, those ideas aren't new, but but they're new in the way that they're attached to atheism. Because even in the past, when people believed in some type of evolution or change over time, they didn't attach it to atheism. It just the the, the thing is, it's also scattered and, and rambling. This sort of uh, argument that he's making it's never really clear where he's going 
and and he just makes a lot of statements. But but he, we can definitely say that the papacy didn't produce atheism, and atheism is not a power. Uh, but also, they're not working in tandem. Correct. Yeah, I mean, some of their goals are the same, but they're they're not working in tandem to achieve those goals. So, yeah. as Angela says in her her note, it's it's sort of a, a backlash to popery, you know, in individuals, right? So that's often, you know, often as I've stated before, like a lot of the atheists. I know that are are sort of reasonable atheists. That is, their their atheism isn't you know uh, you know an attack on other people believing in God. It's just their personal experience. They don't believe in God because you know of how the Catholic Church was that they were raised in, right? So so they had a bad experience, and and there's this option of atheism, so they become atheists. Some of them become Christians later, but it's often this initial backlash to what they see as the only other, you know, the, what's the re- representative of religion. Uh, a lot of really bad ideas in and behavior in Catholicism. Just one little observation about uh, Catholicism and religion in general. So... <clears throat> For a child, can a child understand the the philosophy and the reasoning behind most of what they see presented in Christianity? No. Like if if, if you're a child and you, you're you know you're taught about an eternally burning hell, it's really going to distort how you look at God. Correct. And the and the one thing I like about Adventism raising my children is maybe it's partly the way I raise them, but they don't have this like very negative view, you know, when they're children anyway. I mean, they, you know, there's, each of the children are different, but it was what was presented to them. Wasn't this God who is out to get you, right? That you have to appease, um, you know, maybe maybe they had problems with some of the people, but they definitely don't have problems with the God that's presented. It is a loving God within Adventism, uh, both, you know, in what we say, the doctrines that we teach, but also um, how we relate uh, the religion to our children. It's not a it's not a religion really of do's and don'ts and that's restrictive in in sort of a an arbitrary manner. There's always reasons for everything that we do where in Catholicism, there's not, it's not reasonable. Even if there's some intellectual reason behind why they do certain things, they're definitely not on a level that a child can understand. So anyway, that's sort of an aside, but just an observation. All right. Now, as the paper continues. In other words, France was only the recipient of an ideology that it neither produced nor consciously asked for. But when implemented, this very ideology resulted in her own ruin and in turn the giving of the deadly wound to the papacy. It is unknown if Satan, with his massive intellect, was unable to foresee the consequence of the papal policy or was willing to take the risk in the context of his war against the Bible. It is clear, however, that he learned from it. Now, I don't see how a power is going to ask for an ideology. They're going to implement it, yes. I'm just not happy with the way that this paragraph is constructed. So that's... that's Yeah, I don't know... (laughs) I'm not sure if it makes it makes any sense. And especially when he says in other words. Right. Right. That's what you're talking about here. Well, the, I'm, the idea, like he's not actually putting what he said in other words. He's not stating his premise clearly. Yeah. 
So now, you know, the thing about Satan, what he's saying here about Satan. Yeah. Uh, if it is unknown if Satan with his massive intellect is unable to foresee the consequences. Well, what what I see my observations about Satan's reaction to uh, you know, Bible prophecy, for instance. It it seems that Satan um has a uh, a psychological disorder where at every turn wherever prophecy and history meet satan wants to challenge and defeat god at that point right because he knows about the cross right correct right he knows about the prophecies and yet he he fulfills them Right? You, you understand what I'm saying? No, I get he, that. He, he could just avoid it altogether and say, well, you know, you know God wants me to, you know, get involved in uh, crucifying Jesus, so I, I'm, I'm not going to do anything. But, but he can't. It's like the story of, uh, what is it, the fox and, um, can't remember. It's one of the Aesop's fables. Anyway, he says he can't change his nature. Right? So to expect him to change his nature. The uh, fox and the scorpion. Yeah, yeah, the fox and the scorpion. Yeah, so it's the scorpion's gonna, you know, uh, kill the fox as they're swimming across right. the water. It's in my name. What's that, Angela? Yeah, I, I, I had written that about about the person I'm saying this. It's in my nature. I had the sting. <laughs> it's compulsive. Yeah, and 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 people <laughs> act demonic. To, but people act according to their nature unless that nature is controlled by God, right? So we, we just do the things we do. Um, and, and that's another thing about God is he acts in accordance with his nature, which is love. He can't act differently. So, you know, God is, is restricted in, his, in what he can do because everything he, he does can only be love. Right. So he has he's limited uh, to his options, which is one of the reasons why evil exists, because God is love. He, he can't act differently. He has to allow free will. That makes sense. But but anyway, in this case, um, you know, we can see that uh, Satan, he's he's just acting. According to his nature, so. I don't know if it has much to do with his massive intellect or foreseeing things. He always imagines he can he can beat God at some point. You know, at some point God's going to fail or his people are going to fail. So he is. That's 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 the war that he has against uh, God's people. To say that he's learning, I I think is that Satan hasn't learned anything. Right. So to say it's clear that he has learned from it, I think is a kind of outrageous statement, actually. Right. To be Unless we could say he's not as late. Yeah. Satan is isn't asleep. In some cases, as he was in France. But I mean, it's coming to a point where he is it's going to be as blatant as he was. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, a cr criminals that are so stupid that they just they get caught, you know, uh, and, it, and the reason that they're stupid is because they cannot act differently than the fact that they're criminals. They think a certain way. Satan has a way of thinking. He can't learn. He can think he learned, right? But every time he thinks he's learned, he hasn't. In this kind of a situation, our adversary as you're pointing out, has looked for millennia to find ways to defeat the creator. Mm -hmm. Now, has the creator been hurt? Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that our creator is just as hurt with our adversary's apostasy as he is with our own sin. 
Mm -hmm. The difference here is that our adversary is not learning so much from his defeats because he's going to continue in this in this path until finally he is to bow and admit that the law of God is righteous. Mm -hmm. Now, what he didn't learn, he didn't learn how to defeat the creator at the cross, but he did see his own defeat. Yeah, and, and mostly he's trying to do as much damage as he can. Right. And take as many down with him. But it definitely hasn't really learned anything. It's not like he now has better methods or something. I mean, he, I mean, he's perfected his methods. We could say that, but that's not, that's not really saying too much. Okay. Now the next, the next sentence, I'm, I've had a real issue with how this is written and how this is presented. This is one of the keys to understand the role of atheism, that it came into history as a direct result of the papal policy. And here he uses great controversy 265 to 269 as his proof. Which we read actually quite a bit of that. Atheism Which... was prior to papalism. So how can it come into history as the direct result of papal policy? Yeah. But also, that's also to understand the role of atheism. He doesn't even say, so he says the key to understanding the role of atheism is that it's, it's the result of the papacy, I guess. But, and then he says, because of the papal policy of the suppression of the scriptures from the people in general and the tormenting of the people by the gross misuse of the scriptures, the conditions were ripe for the rise of atheism. Now, I mean, there's there's obviously a truth to that. Um, but I, I'm not sure about along with the necessary infrastructure to support it. I'm not sure what the papacy has to do with that. Um, I mean, there's always been governments. And I wouldn't say the infrastructure was produced by the educational principles that were set in place by the papacy. I just don't really understand. He, he, he keeps stating a bunch of things that he never really shows any evidence for. Like he's, he's assuming all kinds of things that um, I don't think are correct. This is not logical to me. Yeah. Now, his closing sentence of this paragraph, this infrastructure was produced by the educational principles that were set in place by the papacy. The one principle is the cause, the second is the effect. So, so this is going back to these two principles he's talking about? Correct. So, yeah, so it's kind of confusing because he talks about educational principles, but those aren't the principles that... And, of course, these are principles, the things that he calls principles. Educational principles, there are educational pr principles. But, um, the, but he's talking about his two primary principles. And, and that was in the preceding paper, wasn't it? It wasn't in this paper. I was trying to, to delve a first and a second principle out of this paragraph because he gives okay. such a um, such a response in this, but the only principle that he's trying to address here is this educational principle. Right, because, yeah, there's definitely no other principles in this paragraph, but he had talked about two principles before. Correct. But, but I'm never sure what, I don't know if he knows what the word principle means. All right. So, to, to be direct, 
Yes, we have read part of this great controversy, 265 to 269. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrestled with whether he was trying to assess, as he says, the papal policy of the suppression of the scriptures was a principle. And then this leading to the educational issues. I'm, I'm just very confused by this. Yeah. Now the next paragraph where he quotes from the great controversy, um, is interesting or sentence, I guess, but his paragraph that has a sentence from the great well, controversy, his, two paragraphs. The situation here, I mean, again, this is a use of the spirit of prophecy, but is it proper in the context in which he's trying to present this? Not really, no. But but I think that's where he's trying to draw that from this idea that's in there. Okay. Speaking of this time period in France, all this was as Satan would have it. This was... But for ages he had been working to secure. And here is an ellipse. When error in one garb has been detected, Satan only masks it in a different disguise. And multitudes receive it as eagerly as at the first. When the people found Romanism to be a deception, and he could not through this agency lead them to transgression of God's law, he urged them to regard all religion as a cheat and the Bible as a fable. And casting aside the divine statutes, he gave them se- they gave themselves up to unbridled iniquity. Now, if I recall correctly, this is talking about the French Revolution, this, this yeah. particular passage. <clears throat> now, there is a principle here. And and that's uh, one principle that we can see is that Satan works in different forms at different times in order to when when one one form of deception has lost its its influence, he he morphs into some other form of deception. Right. Okay. that's a principle on how Satan acts. But. um So when she has this, uh, when he has this quote, um, all this was as Satan would have it. This was what the, for ages he had been working to secure. Ellen White goes on, his policy is deception from first to last. Now, remember, policy and principle are, are, are these two things that are, are different, right? So Satan has a policy. And, and so it's kind of interesting that Ellen White uses this word, um, because uh, from policy, we get politics. And I guess a principle of Satan is that he's, he's, he's political, but he works with policies because principles, I, I think to a large degree, what are, what are principles? When we think of the word principle, that person has principles. What do we think of? We think if a person has principles, he has rules by which his actions are governed. Yeah. Yeah. He has a high value, right? That is, he's principled. He does things for good reasons. Principles are usually by definition, not always, but, but often they're, they're good, right? Right. They're, they're, they're something that, that is true. Like we could look at mathematical principles. I mean, they're going to work. And when we think about policies, you know, Ellen White says we need principle, not policy, because policies are are sort of man-made rules superimposed over a situation that often cause harm, right? But as a policy can be totally opposed to the principles that it professes to uphold, Correct? Right. Yeah. 
I mean, this is what I ran into at, at the School of the Prophets, where they kept making all of these policies because they were trying to uh, fix problems. But if they had just operated in a principled manner, they wouldn't have had the problems that they had. Right. Right. So, so you can see Satan is really, it's more policy rather than principle that he operates on. I mean, there are principles or rules in which we can observe how he operates. That is, he is deceptive. But he's not principled in being deceptive. That's not like a principle of his. That's a policy of his. His policy is deception. And so everything he's doing is to bring woe and wretchedness upon men, to deface and defile the workmanship of God, to mar the divine purposes of benevolence and love, and thus cause grief in heaven. Then by his deceptive arts, he blinds the minds of men and leads them to throw back the blame of his work upon God, as if all this misery were the result of the creator's plan. In like manner, when those who have been Degraded and brutalized through his cruel power, achieve their freedom. He urges them on to excesses and atrocities. Then this picture of unbridled license is pointed out by tyrants and oppressors as an illustration of the results of liberty. And we've seen this working throughout history, right? I mean, we can see this happening around us today. We can see how Satan is, is working and operating. And, and the average person can't see this. They just react. They, they fall for this deception. So this is where, you know, Satan will, when one error or garb has been detected, he only masks it in a different disguise. Right? And so people, you know, go from the frying pan to the fire, thinking that they're solving a problem. You know, if we overthrow this government or whatever, you know, that everything's going to be wonderful. But but basically, the principles that we need to understand, the principle of love, um, the principles of the gospel are the only thing that is ever going to make our life better. That's why getting caught up in politics, which is policy, is, is not the role of the Christian. Okay. Now... He continues, the single consuming objective of atheism is to overthrow the scriptures in any form. Whether the scriptures suffered corruption by the papal misinterpretations or were given in their purity by Protestantism mattered not to atheism. The Bible is the only real threat to its existence, and the same holds true for the papacy and Islam. They each understand this. This is the other key that allows us to see the true role of atheism. It's absolute and unrelenting war against the scriptures. This, that is its sole purpose of existence. Any entity on earth that holds to the Bible in any form, whether correctly or incorrectly interpreted, will meet the influence of the power of atheism. So in this in this situation, I think it would be better stated that the single consuming objective of the adversary is to overthrow the government mm -hmm. of the Almighty in any form whether this government is expressed by his character or this government is expressed by the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I recognize in this influences of a couple of other parties because the the situation in my conversations with Glenn have had a lot to do with his, you know, my understanding of his selection as to which Bible he's going to use. Now, he is using 
a King James version that was basically accepted after 1826. Because there are many points, especially historical points, that are contained in the Bibles from 1769 to 1826 that you do not find in the Bibles that were published after 1826. So I would have to wonder, you know, if he's, he's basically throwing out anything else in these studies. Yeah. Now in Esword, they use the 1769 King James Version of the Holy Bible. Correct. So you're saying that there is another version. What what is it generally called? Well, okay. Esword is using the 1769 agreed. But the the version that you will find under the King James on Esword will not include anything of the Apocrypha. You have no. to know. Yeah, yeah. But it's still going to have the the what they call the treasury of scripture knowledge. That's the notes that are in the 1769. That's in the in the commentary. So those are the, the notes. Yeah. So they're not going to have the apocrypha. To get the apocrypha, you have to click on uh it's the King James version with the apocrypha. 1611 is the one I, I find has it. Is no, no, a... they have they have right here on my e sword. Okay. The six, 1769 with apocrypha. Oh, really? Yeah. You, did you it's, have... it's a more recent edition. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. I didn't know that that existed. Yeah. So it says here, this is the 1679 King James Version of the Holy Bible, also known as the Authorized Version, with the words of Jesus Christ in red, includes the apocrypha which was part of the King James Bible for 274 years until being removed in 1885, it says. Well, it was, it was the decision of the British and American Bible Societies in 1826 to remove yeah. the Apocrypha. Yeah, but the authorized King James still had it until 1885. Okay. Isn't that interesting that it still had it included until 1885 in the time period where the president of the general conference was making his comments about what portions of the Bible were inspired and what portions were not. And Uriah Smith and his comments about the validity of the visions of Mrs. White. Mm -hmm. That's intriguing. Okay. Thank you for, for informing us of that. I'm, I'm going to look to add that into my collection with yeah. that resource. Okay. Atheism did not and could not remove the system of the papacy, but stood as a catalyst along with France for the removal of the papacy as the fifth kingdom. Um, <clears throat> am, I, am I wrong? <clears throat> I'm sorry, Theodore, what, what Bible was that? 1769, Oxford Revised King James with Apocrypha. Okay. Yeah, but it's they call it in Esort, it's K, uh, KJVA. V -A. Okay. Thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt. No. Your... Any time that you contribute, I look forward to it, brother. This sentence, as it is read, am, am I wrong or is this is this just a total, completely wrong statement of history? Well, it's it's definitely not um, correct. <laughs> I mean, atheism does not stand alone. Well, atheism is an ideology. It's not a power. Right. So he has 
ideology and power conflated. Yeah, and, and ideologies don't have goals or aims. Right. Right. I mean, you sort of in a loose way could say, well, you know, atheism under France, you know, it goal, its goal, but it'd be the goal of France, you know, because but stood as a catalyst along with France for the removal of the papacy as the fifth kingdom. So you could say that atheism, well, as a catalyst, you know, which is part of a chemical reaction, right, that, that initiates a chemical reaction. It's, it's something that you, you need. Um, but I don't know. It's just kind of awkward, this whole idea that he's trying to present. But he has reasons why he's doing it, why he's saying this. And, and, but they're not really clear, but you can sort of discern as you look at his arguments further what he's trying to set up. Okay. But to hold in the larger context that atheism or Islam are in a war against the papacy or that the papacy is at war with them would be to deny this principle of a divided house laid out by Christ himself. Okay. There's a principle that was established. I believe this is established not only by history, but also isn't it established in the spirit of prophecy that Islam had been raised up to basically run interference for the people of God? Yeah. That's what we understand. Okay. But but he's arguing that they, they can't be at war against themselves. Right. Which, which, of course, they are at war with each other. They've always been at war with each other. Yeah. I mean, it's... Yeah, I, so he tries to say, well, they're in the same house. Now, now he hasn't really... Um, like, he, he wants to introduce Islam here. Again. Right. But... Yeah, so he wants, when he talks about atheism and Islam and the papacy, so, so he's just kind of saying they're all, they're all on the same side. Um, but part of this is uh, when, when you get to the next paragraph. That, uh, so he sets up what he calls this principle. Um, we should not be looking for a satanic power to push against another satanic power or to come back against itself as a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. Well, right. Okay. You, you can see where he's going with that. Let's let, let's take this a little more simply. Okay. When Hagar was weeping after she and Ishmael had been cast out of Abraham's house. And the angel came to her. What was the prophecy that was given regarding Ishmael? His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. Right. So in this situation, how can the papacy and Islam be of one house if Islam is going to have its hand against every man and every man would have to include the papacy. Yeah. But also when you deal with Daniel 11 verse 40 to 45, mm -hmm. all of these powers are satanic powers. Right. Right. And especially at the end of the world, because we see that, that, the, that it's also going to arise out of the bottomless pit. The papacy is. Right. So Islam arises out of the bottomless pit. The papacy arises out of the bottomless pit. I mean, they're all satanic powers. It's it's it just doesn't make any sense. Obviously, they won't in the end be able to stand, but it doesn't mean that they don't fight against each other. Or that that their goals are always the same. You know, one of, one of the things that we see with these three powers, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, the United States, the Catholic Church, 
and and the Soviet Union back in, you know, prior to the fall of the Soviet Union, they all were seeking for the same prize. Right. Right. Control of the world. And you so I mean, are they working in concert to get the same prize or in no. tandem? No. no, they're they they make false alliances. They in order to lies at one table. Yeah. So so they all have the same the same goal. We saw that with of course with uh, um uh Augustus and uh um Mark Antony. Yeah, Anthony. Yeah. So so you know, so you can see that 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 this always happens. What what Jesus is saying that a house divided against itself will not cannot stand because um you know, Satan casting out Satan. It, there's a certain context in which he's he's talking about it. Doesn't mean that that um that satanic powers don't fight against each other. Right. It's like, you know, criminals in a criminal organization. Um, you know, you can have people in the mafia. Are they are they going to be working together? Not always. No, not always. Right. Sometimes what they're doing is actually to to position themselves to take over from someone else. So so there can be lots of things going on behind the scenes where they're stabbing each other in the back. So it's just kind of a silly argument. Like it's, but but he's going to use this as a major argument for how he's going to interpret Daniel 11, verse 40. Right, that's what he's going to do. And okay. he's one, taking a lot of time to set up this argument, which isn't a very good one. It's, it's a poorly constructed argument that is not germane to the main items that he's trying to present. Yeah, and it definitely wouldn't be the key to understanding Daniel 11, verse 40. No. Because one is it's wrong, but also that's not how we study the Bible or understand prophecy. He, he's basically set up a philosophical argument. Right. Rather than comparing scripture with scripture and seeing what the Bible says. And to understand the symbols and who's involved. In this type of a situation, you can see very decidedly the influences of Uriah Smith and the influences of Froome in the way that he is attempting to state and present his arguments. Mm -hmm. Now, a point for clarification. The KJVA that is available with ESOR yeah. does not include the other margin references that you will find in the actual 1769 Bible. Well, it does have the Treasury of Scripture knowledge, which is those marginal references. But that's part of the commentaries. Okay, but I'm I'm giving reference to the Treasury of Scripture knowledge. Yeah. It does not include all of the marginal references that you would find in the physical 1769 Bible. Okay. Well, what mine says about, uh, let me see here. Um, I'll, I'll give you a specific. Yeah, because this is that this is the Treasury of Scripture knowledge is published in 1834. Okay, right. So it's based on the marginal readings in the 1769. And, and I mean, because you've when you've gone through it and you brought up the 1769, they're almost identical. There's just a few places here and there that they differ. Okay. But yeah, they don't. They don't have those marginal readings because the Bible itself is just the Bible, right? It's not going to have marginal readings in any of their Bibles. 
right on eSword. My my reference here. Yeah. Like I am looking at Deuteronomy twenty eight fifteen because that's one of my other studies right now is Deuteronomy yeah. twenty eight. Well, it does have most of the marginal references. Yeah. It omits any marginal reference into the from apocrypha. the apocrypha. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. I think that's the only real difference that I saw right. with uh, Treasury of Scripture knowledge uh, and in yours is that, yeah, they just took the Apocrypha readings out of it or references out of it. Okay. I apologize for that uh, aside. I just wanted to make it very clear. Yeah. Now, this paragraph, as it is written, ends with a, a very interesting statement. But to hold in the larger context that atheism or Islam is at war against the papacy or that the papacy is at war with them would be to deny this principle of a divided house laid out by Christ himself. I have yet to find a time where the papacy has not been at war with Islam or Islam at war with with any other man. Yeah. And and so he would have to say, well, they're not really at war. That's just some kind of pretension. Right. And which is, of course, crazy. And that's that's a complete denial of scripture. Yes. Yeah. So I guess that would be the main thing uh, is it's a denial of scripture. Um, but I know, you know, we got. um, um His name escapes me. Um, the guy from South Africa, Walter Weiss. Right. Um, you know, he tries to claim that Islam was created by the papacy, which there's just no evidence for that at all. But this this would be part of that sort of thinking. Now, somebody's trying to say something. Stephen tried to say something. Okay, Stephen. Try to say something again. You were kind of breaking up. You're muted right now. Well, maybe he didn't want to say something. <clears throat> okay. Atheism or Islam as a system from the perspective of paganism, papalism, or apostate Protestantism can only ever be an accessory and are always under the control of one of these powers. I disagree. Yeah. I, I I mean, I have no nothing else to stand on but scripture here. But yeah. I have to disagree. His point is completely out of line. Isma, Islam is a wild man and out of control of all of these powers. They've tried to seek to control Islam, but they've never been able to. There is no question that God can and does use evil entities to check evil and to remove and set up kingdoms. And that nation will rise up against nation. But in the overall context, Satan is not at war with himself. And Satan is at war with himself. That's why his kingdom will not stand. Right. So as as a, a major argument this falls apart when compared with scripture. And if this is one of the cornerstones of the case that he is building, his case is now falling apart. Mm-hmm. Now, now he's basing this upon the story where say, where Jesus says that Satan, you know, doesn't cast out Satan, right? Right. That's basically where he's getting this idea from. But that's a different context, because that's Christ casting out uh, Satan, right? And and so even in that context, he you know he could be saying, well, if Satan's casting out Satan, you know, his kingdom isn't going to stand. But but the point is, Jesus is not Satan, and he's not casting out demons in the name of Satan. So he, he's just taking this and misapplying it. 
With this principle in mind, we should not be looking for a satanic power to push against another satanic power or to come back against itself as a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, and many ships. Again, here I'm having heartburn Mm -hmm. because this statement following this prior paragraph is totally out of line. This word push in Daniel 1140 is the key to understand the nature of the battle of the king of the south against the papacy. So in other words, without saying it, he is declaring the papacy as the king of the north and that another power is going to push against the papacy. Yeah, so now he's... Yeah, okay, go on. If, if he was to... If we were to accept his premise, then the king of the south must be of God to press against the papacy. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case here at all. Mm -hmm. In the King James Bible, the word push is always used in conjunction with horns, and horns are specific to a particular kingdom or nation. Any thoughts? Any comment? I just go on. Okay. When considering the timing of the introduction of the King of the South and North within the context of the time of the end, and here he wants to quote the time of the end, it is important to realize that there were three entities in particular that became active. Now, He's not stating who he's quoting because the rest of this is left outside of a quote. Atheism, the United States of America, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The papacy and Islam were both on the decline. The papacy went down in 1798, and Islam in the form of the Ottoman Empire went down on August 11, 1840. So is this is this an attempt to quote from the great controversy? No, I don't think so. I'm not sure what he's doing, but. Okay. Just as the new view of the daily confuses the issue by ascribing godly characteristics to a satanic element. So the reverse is true in our identification of the king of the south and north in verse 20. Or verse 40, without exception in our Adventist interpretations, these kings are identified as satanic, thereby pitting one satanic entity against another satanic entity. If this were the case, then Satan's kingdom could not stand. It is the same principle as that of France when they called evil good and good evil. So he's proving a point in this that he's not clearly understanding the entire situation Mm -hmm. the king of the north and the king of the south are not one is good and one is not good they are both evil they are both of the adversary the lineage of atheism and islam is shown to be from the bottomless pit of which Satan, in the primary sense, is king. One is a god to the godless, the other is a god to the descendants of Ishmael. Of the descendants of Ishmael, it is noted in the scriptures that they will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand will be against him. They are identified as the four angels let loose in Revelation 9.15, and a strong case can be made that Islam is the primary entity of the angry horse seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. Here he's wanting to quote 20 manuscript release 216.6. So, how do we see this? 
how how should we continue to apply this? Okay, so what he's tried to argue is that satanic powers never fight against themselves, which right. of course is historically not correct and also biblically not correct. So he's going to argue that they aren't satanic powers fighting against themselves in Daniel 11, verse 40. That one's a godly power and one's a satanic power. Now, in this series of articles, he, he's going to get up to article number 12, I believe. Correct. He's been working on 13 for a while. Yeah. So 13 is where he's going to actually reveal who he thinks the king of the north and the king of the south is. Correct. But but he hasn't revealed that yet. Now, he's struggling to write it. He, well, I can see why. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I think is important when somebody's presenting is you need to present your conclusion at the beginning, right? That is, if you want people to understand what you're saying, you need to say, here's what I think, right? And then you show them why you think that. But he's he's never done that. We don't know where he's going. And that makes it really hard to follow. But we can we can sort of piece together as we look through these articles where he's going. But it's not going to be a correct. He's he's on a wrong path. We can just see him constantly going off off track. You know, it doesn't follow. He's he's not going to end up with a, with a conclusion that's going to be convincing for one, but also it. I don't know how he could even draw the conclusions that he's going to draw, some of the conclusions that he's drawn. You know, he tends to contradict himself quite a bit. It, it, it's sad as to how confused this presentation has become. Yeah. Now It's like he's gone more and more off track as time goes on. Right. Okay. Now, this reference from 20 Manuscript Release was a letter that Mrs. White wrote to her son, Willie. And the context that is being used in this, in this small portion of the quotation, I don't find that it's germane to his article. The paragraph that we would find, which is paragraph 23, which is a symbol has, has no bearing on anything, yeah. would be this. The Lord is full of resources. He has no lack of facilities. It is because of our lack of faith, our earthliness, our cheap talk, our unbelief manifested in our conversation that dark shadows gather about us. Christ is not revealed in word or character as the one altogether lovely and the chiefest among 10,000. When the soul is content to lift itself up into vanity, the spirit of the Lord can do little for it. Our short-sighted vision beholds the shadow, but cannot see the glory beyond. Angels are holding the four winds, which are represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. Shall we sleep on the very verge of the eternal world? Shall we be dull and cold and dead? Oh, that we might have in our churches the spirit and the breath of God breathed into his people, that they might stand upon their feet and live. We need to see that the way is narrow and that the gate is straight. But as we pass through the straight gate, the wideness is without limit. Now, very interesting math. Yeah, so that, that 20 manuscript releases 216 
0.6. So 216 is just simply 6 times 6 times 6, right? right? So you get 216. And then if you multiply that by 6, you get uh, 1296, the number of days between where you, you and I are born. Right. And then, and then you multiply that by 20, and you get the number of parts of the Hebrew day, 25920, which is also the, the number of years in the procession of the equinoxes procession, um, which, you know, we deal with that uh, molad number. So we can take the parts of the day and deal with the parts of the month mm -hmm. as being said, six, five, four, three, two plus one parts. Um, which, which, which I did a paper on and we've addressed before. So I just thought that was kind of interesting because we got this statement dealing with Islam, which, uh, you know, part of what we deal with Islam is, is the moon, right? So it's, uh, it's just interesting. Well, the other thing that, that I'm, I'm struggling with, he makes, this point regarding the descendants of Ishmael mm -hmm. and his in his sentence and paragraph structure he identifies the descendants of Ishmael as being a wild man his hand against every man and every man's hand against him mm -hmm. they are identified as the four angels let loose in Revelation 9.15. So is Islam being identified as one as these four angels? As the four angels that hold back the that 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 are let loose or that let loose the right. you know, because the four angels let loose uh Um, let me see. So, Revelation nine fifteen. Yeah, I don't quite uh, understand how he's looking at that verse. Well, okay. Because in nine fifteen, you got um, uh, so the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year for to slay the third part of men. So when we deal with um. So the sixth angel which had a trumpet, uh, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So one is we have this, this connection to the river Euphrates. Right. Which we, we always connect to the fall of Babylon. Right? Correct. Okay. Because that's where Babylon is, is on the river Euphrates. Now, um, so this is going to be the, um, the fall of, of, um, the capital of, of the, of Eastern Rome, right? That's what's going to happen. So, so, so Constantine, the, the 13th, right? I think Say, that's correct. Yeah. Um, Dracozis. He's going to uh, submit to the four uh, is sultans. Is Stephen trying to say something? Yes, he is. Okay. Yeah. You, you must have a bad connection, Stephen. So what's the 11th? The 11th. Okay, right. Yes, yeah, it's that's... the 11th. The 11th. Okay, that makes more sense. I knew I was doing something wrong. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, so we've got Constantine the 11th. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so that's what's going to be referred to, is this is going to be destruction that comes against Constantinople. Right. Historically, that's how we would look at this. Um, I'm not sure how he's applying. Well, from taking 
from taking this and comparing it directly with the scripture. We know that Revelation 9.13 gives reference to the sixth angel that sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before the Lord. Saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year to slay the third part of men. Which is the third part refers to Eastern Rome. Okay. Now, the premise that he's making here is that these four angels are Islam. Or would at least well, seem to be Islam. Yeah, well, they, they are, right? So, so they're, they're connected to, um, say I connect them to the four Turkish sultans is what I do. Because remember, they're bound, right? Because they can, they can wound and not kill, right? For that period of 150 years. Okay. Right? Once they, um, and, and that's a characteristic of not just 150 years, but all, all that period of Islam. They can't overthrow Eastern Rome. So under the, the fifth trumpet, you know, they, they're causing destruction. But Constantinople is still going to be the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. Now, it is actually going to be conquered temporarily by the, by the Catholic, by um, Western Rome which is kind of interesting. But um, but ultimately it falls, Eastern Rome falls under uh, the second woe, right? And it's going to be four years after um, the second woe begins that Constantinople is going to fall. So in 15, 15 oh, what is it? Uh, I always get this wrong. What is it? 14? 1499. Yeah, so in, yeah, so you're going to have, you know, 14, 1449, that's when uh begins, so it's going to be 1453. Did I do that right? I always do this wrong. D don't ask me why. Yes, 1453 is the fall of Constantinople. Yeah, okay, so I got that right, yeah. So in 1449, the Second World begins, and in 1453, we have the fall of Constantinople. So that's what's being addressed here. Now, it's going to, now, remember, though, that there's going to be, they're prepared for an hour, day, a month, and a year. So we know that this, this symbol gives us the 391 years and 15 days. But it also gives us a specific date for when uh, the woe ends, right? Agreed. And and so th there's lots in there, but I, I don't know how he's interpreting this. That's part of my problem. Like, he's not really addressing what the verse is referring to. Like, he's not really doing a Bible study. Well, in the, in the way that this is being stated from... Revelation. Mm -hmm. Saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. They're not bound at. They are bound in. Now, if one is standing upon the waters, or we see great waters addressed, symbolically, prophetically, what do the waters represent? Well, peoples. But yeah, I, I wouldn't say that the word is in and not at, because the word can be translated as at. Okay. I'm right. just going according to the English translation. Yeah, because the word epi 
It's a primary preposition, properly meaning superimposition of time, place, order, etc., in relation to distribution. Uh, that is over, upon, right? Um, so it depends on the case. And in this case, um, I'm going to look at it here. I hate looking at Greek. <laughs> okay, that's why. Looking at the wrong verse. I'm just looking at the form here. Okay, well, you're looking at the form. From the chat, the comment was made. Interesting that Gonin Diop was seen and heard reciting the Quran according to David Barron. I listened to Garin Diop accuse true Protestants of slandering the Roman Catholic communion, which he claimed has changed since Vatican II in 1965, and that we should be having amiable relations with the papal whore now. God for the expose of the director, glad for the expose of the director of PARL. I had before this in my files a document in which Diop is pontificating, pun intended, on the benefits of ecumenicanism. Ecumenican. Ecumenism. I, I, I struggle with that word. Yeah, ecumenism. Okay, anyway. So, just for my own clarification. I don't know who these people are. Okay. Help me understand. Um, P-A-R-L can be public affairs and religious liberty under the Adventist church. It can also be the Providence Animal Rescue League in Rhode Island. <laughs> Probably the, the, the former. <laughs> Perhaps both of you can move the office. Maybe he'd do a better job taking care of animals. <laughs> I just, I, I had to ask. I mean, What's GD? That's, That's just the abbreviation of Gen, Gen Yon, I don't know who he is. Yeah. Sad to say, I think we're all going to very soon find out. Yeah. Well, he's steering don't pay the church more and more towards the papacy. He's one of them. Yeah, is well, this, I had to watch is, this is one. Because on the, the next Catholic is, the of this church is being ruined. Um, but anyway, yeah, so actually that word there that you say is is actually the primary way to translate it is at. Okay. Instead of in, because uh, it's in the dative case, the, the the whole thing that it's modifying. And so it's at or on. Um, that's what they say. <clears throat> um, and that is... Um, <coughs> Of direction with, of direction, so add on, etc. Of direct, so that would be of rest. So in the dative case, it's of rest. At on in, it's about rest. If it was in the accusative, it'd be about direction. Who, I don't who, understand. I'm sorry. Who is David Bar? Is that David Bar Bar? Baron David. Barrett, yeah, Barrett, Barrett. He's, something. he's, he's what the, uh, he's, yeah, he's what the mainstream church would be one of the offshoot guys, but he's right on about the op, unfortunately. Okay, anyway, I, I never pay attention to any other kind of stuff, but, but getting back to dealing with, um, the passage. So, Dwight, you're trying to say here that the four angels that are loosed these are just God's angels. Is that what you're arguing? That they're not Islam itself? Well, I'm again, as we compare scripture with scripture, yeah. and as we identify these and begin looking at this with 
the spirit of prophecy. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to do this because to me, from what we've just read in the, in the preceding paragraphs, this has not been done. Yeah. Well, definitely he hasn't, he hasn't done a Bible study. He hasn't really used the scriptures according to Miller's rules. Right. Basically, he set up a philosophical argument, very weak argument, and and has used some scriptures, but not used them correctly. Right. So, you know, when you have these these four angels are loosed. I mean, we know that we're going to have four winds that are also loosed, right? They're held back and restrained. Um, so I sort of connect this this with Islam as well, these four angels being loosed, I've connected them with the four um, sultans. That's that's the way that I've done it. Right? Now, we know that these are going to, Islam is going to be restrained at the end of this period of time when, uh, you know, the Turkish sultan has to submit to the four European powers. Right. So it sort of mirrors what happened with um, <clears throat> Constantine the 11th when he's going to submit to the four Turkish sultans in order to become the emperor. Right. He didn't have to do that, but he chose to do that. Um, so that's the way that I understand this. But he's not really using this this. This properly, so he's going to mention Revelation nine fifteen, and and but all this is really going against his whole art. Well, so he's going to try to say that Islam's a satanic power, um, it's but it's not going to be fighting against other satanic powers. Yet it clearly is being described here as fighting against other satanic powers, right? Exactly. So it's like. How are, you, how are you making this argument? You just shot yourself in the foot. So he continues to segue into other portions. Now, at this, at this junction, he wishes to introduce a couple more concepts from Scripture. We have a short amount of time. I'm going to cover these in a cursory manner. And then we're going to need to look to return to this when we come back to this study on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hope he gets his number 13 done. Because I want to see what he thinks. I, I mean, I think I know what he's going to say. Okay. But... Um, because I've read the other ones. But yeah, it's not, uh, it doesn't make any sense, his ideas. They're, they're not well formed and they're contradictory. And it's, and he's not following Miller's rules and he's going to bring them up again in the next article. Right. right? You know, he's just going to say, but, and then he's not going to follow any of the rules that he brings up. So, okay. Revelation 9 verse 2 and he opened the bottomless pit and there arose smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke and of the pit atheism is, dis is portrayed as a beast as opposed to Islam which is portrayed as smoke smoke and incense denote the prayers of a people here he uses Revelation 8.4. Atheism does not send up any prayers to any god, but Islam sends up its prayers into the heavens to Allah, portrayed as smoke, obscuring from the people the worship of the true God. The Quran is not compatible with the Holy Bible, as it denies that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This is the source of the smoke from the bottomless pit, 
and is directed against God's word. Okay, so he's made these statements, yep. but he hasn't shown any of this. He wants us to accept as fact his statement. Yeah. But he is providing no concrete confirmation of his understanding. Mm -hmm. now, now, we have taken that the smoke represents the teachings of Islam. Right. Right. So, I mean, and, but, but we have ways in which we do that. It's something that obscures in this context. So he kind of has that right. But atheism is not portrayed as a beast, right? Francis. Right. Okay. Um, and then and then it says portrayed as a beast as opposed to Islam, which is portrayed as smoke. Well, is Islam portrayed as smoke? No. Right? Correct. It's, it's not portraying Islam as smoke. Islam is portrayed as locusts, which have give, been given the power as the scorpions of the earth have power. It's also portrayed as horsemen. Yeah, yes, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, so it's also going to be trade. There's, there's shapes of the locusts like under horses, right? Um, so, uh, so the smoke is not Islam. The smoke is representing the teachings of Islam. So in this, we, we have points where a proper application of Miller's rules would show that the premises that he is attempting to, pr to provide would not hold. Now, we are now at the end of our study for the day. We will return to this portion, beginning with Revelation 9-2 and the following paragraphs, when we begin again on Sunday. Are there any other comments, thoughts, or questions at this time? So, shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, Help us now, guide us, please, in all things, so that that which is done may be to your glory. Help us to consider that which we are learning. As we study, help us to follow those rules that you have set before us. Direct our efforts today so that you may be glorified. Help us and guide us to this end. I thank you for each that has attended this meeting, for each that has participated, and for each that have listened. May your will be done in our lives as your will is done in heaven. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.